welcome to Old Camp. Have you had a nice day? Yes! Excellent. Thank you very much indeed for staying around. We really do appreciate it. We should just go around and introduce ourselves, because there are people who come to Old Camp who don't listen to either Linux Outlaws or Ubuntu UK podcast. Uh, <laughs> one person. Uh, everybody else who falls into that category has clearly gone home already. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's start at the far end. Who are you, sir? Uh, my name's Dan. Hello. This feels like an AA meeting or something. <laughs> um, this is my first meeting here. Um, <laughs> Which podcast now, are you on? Yeah, I'm on uh, Linux Outlaws, and uh, I'm sure some of you know me, so hello. Nice to be here. Thank you for coming. Cool. Thank you, Dan. I'm Laura Cowan, and I'm on the UPC podcast, Ubuntu UK podcast. My name is Fab, uh, Fabian Scherschel, if you speak German, yeah. and uh, I'm a yeah. caffeine addict, uh, and I'm on Linux Outlaws as well. Yeah, and I'm the Jaffa Cake addict. Jaffa I Cake confess. Addict. Right, okay. <laughs> I am the Alan Pope. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise known as Popey. I'm. Yes. Otherwise known as Blaine Popey. <laughs> I'm Mark, otherwise known as Mark. And yeah. I'm also on the Ubuntu UK podcast. Joining us on stage for his first live Odd Camp show. How are you feeling? Um, better than I did at nine o'clock this morning when oh, right. nothing appeared to be working. Oh, uh, yeah. That was, that was fun. And I'm Tony. And you can tell who we are because we all have T-shirts on that Fab has oh, yeah. very kindly designed for us. Um, uh, apparently, I'm Ack, judging by the colour of the hair. <laughs> yes. I was going to ask why you had ginger hair. Uh, yeah. It's a colour management issue. I'm right, sorry for okay. that. <laughs> colour management on Linux is a whole hour show. I'm sure we yeah. can do. But, yeah, in case you forget who we are, we, we're now branded. We did think about swapping shirts and then coming out and <laughs> the wrong person. Um, what else have we got to cover in the intro, Alan? Uh, we've got some thank yous to our sponsors. Oh, yeah. Um, love them. First of all, uh, Bite Mark, who are fantastic. Tim. Take a look at Bite Mark. Tim. In fact, yeah. if you need, you you may need have, a web you may post, check them out. You may have seen these bottle openers around the place, and um, I'd like to thank Bite Mark for it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were Radio 4. They don't do that on Radio 4. They don't do that on Radio 4. You don't know what they do quite Giles Brandreth doesn't do that on his He show. does. You does just he? don't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> it's the wonders of radio. You can get away with anything. Right, okay. Who else have we got to thank? Canonical? Google. Oh, Google and Canonical. Okay. Mm-hmm. Google and uh, Canonical both sponsored us very kindly. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. You're here because they paid. Chris Proctor for log.org.uk. Yeah, Chris for log.org.uk. Where is Thank you very much, Chris. Where, Where is he? Where are you, Chris? Man, you're back. He's only harder than him. him. He's at the back. He's not just a faceless corporation. He's got an actual face. <laughs> <laughs> and you can stroke it later. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Bitfolk, but not for free. Bitfolk, who are sponsoring our party tonight. Hooray. Yeah. I've always said... Yay! Yes. If you want a party, go to Bitfolk. A press, A press, who have given us some of the raffle prizes, books. books. Thank you very much, A press. Oh, really, O'Reilly? Oh, really, O'Reilly? Oh, really? Josette, out in this outside, um, they've also provided you with those drinks that you had at lunchtime. And some, some vouchers had. for the raffle. Mm. And vouchers for the raffle. So thank you very much, O'Reilly. And sorry for getting your logo wrong. <laughs> and Linux format. Linux format's our media partner. I did this. Uh, who saw the advert in Linux format for the for the event? Okay. Oh, wow. Who saw it because we told you to look at it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's good, wasn't it? Who it's came here because you saw the advert? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Is there anybody Nobody. from Linux format here? No. Right. right. <laughs> Phew. What else they might hear this. And it. they've given us a, a, a subscription for the raffle. Today. They have indeed, yes. Cool. Mm-hmm. Cool. That's it. And, yeah. So, have we had a good day up here, folks? Have yes. you enjoyed it? Yes. 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 It's been a little bit hair-raising. We got here eventually. <laughs> Anybody got uh, what, uh, what's the best thing you've seen today? Um, I'm trying to think. Probably Karen arguing with Simon Phipps. That was quite yeah. impressive. Yeah. That was quite good. Um, and follow, closely followed by Fab and Ack. Yeah. Been a bit of a set, set two. two. Um, I expect them to do tag team at some point. I thought they're like, you know, Ack was going to tag out and Simon Phipps yeah. was going to come in, but it didn't happen. <laughs> Old Camp Smackdown should happen. Yeah. <laughs> Keep that for next year. Yeah, yeah. Put that one in the ideas bank. Yeah, so uh, d- nearly didn't make it here, actually, today. Um, about half an hour ago, I thought I'd you know, just pop to the loo and, uh, before the live show and uh, ended up getting stuck in the loo because it turned out all three cubicles hadn't got any paper in it. I had a great call over the radio is this, saying, is this oh, can someone bring us some toilet paper, please? Yeah, so I ended up calling over the radio. Is that why you put that thing over the... Ta- yeah, I was yeah. walking down the road. <laughs> 
and uh, taking Karen to the station and I, over, the, over my radio I can hear can we have a lot of toilet roll to uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean loads of toilet roll to, uh, <laughs> only because there were three cubicles I didn't need it all myself I just like to make that clear but yeah we, we squeaked through and we made it here <laughs> no not like that <laughs> oh honestly grow up you naughty naughty people right <laughs> let's get on with the first segment Right, there we go. I didn't even know it was going to stop. Uh, yeah, so I'm sure none of you can have failed to notice from the day-to-day style news coverage lately that we had some civil unrest in this country um, over the last week or so. And um, yeah, and we, we just wanted to talk about it because... You all right there? Yeah. No worries. <laughs> we got some civil unrest on the stage. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so it, it brings. Uh, there's lots of people talking at the moment. David Cameron and all these other people are talking about social media is to blame for this, and the internet's to blame, and everyone seems to be to blame, but them basically. Um, yeah, and I, we just wanted to talk about the fact that uh, social media and all the rest of it. I mean, I don't know. I'm, my personal view is that you can't blame social media for starting riots because at the same time, the next day you had a group of 200 people who'd all met on Facebook got together to clean up all the stuff. Mm. Isn't, so, that, isn't that just a reaction, though? The, the people who came and cleaned up did that as a reaction to what happened before. There was, there's nobody that I know that spontaneously goes out and decides to clean up their area mm. it, unless there has been a riot the day before. Well, it's an interesting Arguably, point. didn't need doing, but... Yeah, it's an interesting point. Well, yeah, in my environment. Right. If, you, <laughs> <laughs> if you expand it out to, say, the wider internet and not just social media, how many groups and charities and all those kind of people are on the internet and bringing people together and stuff spontaneously, not because of riots, who are using the internet as a great communication tool, which is what it is, and using it for good. It doesn't have to be... I don't, I don't think the tool is to blame. I think it's people who are using it. I don't see David Cameron on Twitter very often, so <laughs> are the people who seem to be calling for this... Yeah, he's, he's on Identica. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh it's he him and Fab, the two of them, is it? Right. <laughs> I left. <laughs> yeah, Nick Clegg's on Google Plus. <laughs> All on his own. All on his own. Yeah, he's got no circles. <laughs> One of the things. That <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that um, was being touted in, in uh, David Cameron's speech uh, that he made in the House of Commons, I think, it's on Thursday or Wednesday, and um, was very much along the lines of, well, "We should be out. We should be able to block, turn off Twitter. You know, block the uh, the communication methods that people are using to organise these sort of things." As you say. Damn, blaming the tool, um, despite the fact that obviously it can do good. But regardless of, uh, of, of, of just exactly what those people were using it for, is it ever right to be able to cut off people's means of communications? You know, Iran, Twitter was used as, 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 as against the state mm. by the people, and arguably the rioters last week were using it against the state for the, the group of people who were involved in it, yet we felt the other, or some people felt the other way around, and actually, yes, we should turn off all these messaging services and leave people in the dark not knowing what was going on. Mm. And it seemed incredibly kind of... Uh, it was a difficult position. It was a Surely difficult. people will just work around it. I mean, they were using, allegedly, BlackBerry Messenger. You know, they could use anything from IRC to MSN to, you know, anything. Mm. They could use anything. And to block one, they'll just move yeah, somewhere yeah. else. Block that, have they'll to block move somewhere the else. the internet and yes. all of the cell networks. Yes. And basically all communication. I was creating posters for Oddcamp most of the time, so I didn't actually watch much of the news. But I knew what was going on because of the Twitter retweets yeah. my mum was doing. And they kept coming to my phone, and that's how I knew what was going on. Mm. Cool. And in fact, how I knew there wasn't any trouble in my area was because yes. I was following uh, my local police force who were saying, don't listen to all the retweeted rumours. Everything's fine. Go about your business as normal. <laughs> We've always which, been at war with Eurasia. Yeah. <laughs> Without <laughs> their which, word, you know. Of course. I th- I- we, we have got a microphone going around. If anybody's got a point they want to add, please put up their hand and a microphone monkey will run around and give them a microphone. microphone um, but carry on, sorry. I, I just wanted to very quickly say, I think you, you made a good point there when you said, um, you, you, Laura said, you learned, that, you learned all that from Twitter. I think the way we get the news these days is rapidly changing. Um, I, I go on Twitter, Identica, whatever, Google+, to, to figure out what is happening in my town. Because the newspaper will tell me the next day, and if I hear a loud explosion, I don't want to know the next day what happened. <laughs> I mean, I, th- I think the, the actual media, um, the, 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 the channels we used to use, 
um, actually not up to the times, and we, we, are, we are now switching to something else, and they can't just turn that off. Mm. Tim? I mean, I think I absolutely agree with you um, on, on, on these bases. Um, we have to look at whether turning off social media is a proportional response to the kind of issues there, and, and clearly it's a kind of knee-jerk reaction to people saying something needs to be done, why don't we do this? Um, what, pe what, we, what we need to kind of impress is that the positive reactions to all of these social media kind of things, the riot cleanup, would not have happened without social media. And indeed, lots of positive things wouldn't have happened without the social media response. Um, so, yeah. Mm. Yeah, Andy? Yeah, can I just add that, you know, the whole turn off social media thing. Um, so I spent some time in a country that's done that last year called China. And so how come if China's turned it all off, that there's a, a, a four-square mayor of Tiananmen Square. And, <laughs> yeah. and the answer is uh, proxies. Yeah. Um, so it's not really a very practical idea, which I think most of us realise, but certain people in the government may not. Well, that's it. I mean, during the uh, digital economy bill that we saw last year going through to become the Digital Economy Act, um, there was a lot of talk about filtering and, and um, potentially blocking and censoring the web f for the whole country. What they're talking about or at least the proposals I understand it here, is very much turning off cells in a particular area, which would be quite effective. Um, it would provide a, bl you know, a blank blanket cutout for people who are using mobile internet connectivity within a geographic area. And if you're the person on the receiving end of a petrol bomb and you're trying to dial 999 on the only device you have, which is a cell phone, well, presumably, you are ultimately screwed. Well, presumably it's only the data side they will switch off. But it's a very different tactic from saying, let's block Twitter for the whole of a country. Mm. It's, it's quite localised and... Okay, uh, yes, it would inconvenience non-rioters, but it would also potentially effectively disrupt those communications. There's a microphone has gone over here. Sorry. Hi. Um, I'm not a fan of uh, the Conservative government uh, any more than anybody else, probably. Um, we deliberately keeping the, 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 the political but side of <laughs> I don't believe that either. <laughs> but, but, I, but I did watch on, on BBC Parliament the entire speech that Cameron gave, and he did mention the possibility of blocking the internet, but he also mentioned that it was a very good force for good as well. And mm. so I think there's probably been a bit, lot of negative reporting about this and uh, mm. it wasn't anywhere near as big in the actual speech as it's been made out. Mm. I, I think, okay. I think we, we have to make a big thing out of that because if a politician is, is considering to possibly do this, I think we have to fight this. Um, I think we can't... We, we're living... I mean, I'm not from the UK, but you know, I'm, I'm from Germany. We're, we're all living in, a, in democratic societies and our politicians actually attack other countries like, like Egypt when they turn off the internet. Mm. Uh, and as soon as something happens at home, suddenly um, they're talking about doing it here as well. And I, I think you can't do that. Um, mm. you, you, you will put yourself on the same level as these countries when you do that. So something I, I wonder yeah. about is how much of this reporting is over the top as well. Because mm. I'd, I'd like to do like a show of hands. How many people actually... So, uh, sorry, yeah, because people have <laughs> put their hands up to do things. <laughs> if you, you want to ask questions, just put your hand down for a sec. Um, how many people actually saw, I mean, in real life and not on television, any riots going on? I mean, did you see a lot of it? Yeah. So let's just see some hands. Who actually saw it out of the people in this room for, their, for themselves? So we got like, half that's a, about half a dozen, less than nine. 10 people yeah. in the whole room. Because, um, sorry, <laughs> uh, we'll get a mic to you in a sec. <laughs> um, but the thing was, I mean, I, I went out in Liverpool on... All right, okay, Liverpool's got a bit of a reputation. And I went out... Oh. In, we now have to have a riot, and that wasn't a riot. Um, on, <laughs> on, on Tuesday night, I went in... Someone said to me... Um, I was supposed to be meeting a friend at a pub in, the, in town, and he said, oh, there's no point in going, everything's locked. Like, the whole town's locked. And I thought, no. And, the, and then he said, don't... And all these people Not on Twitter... Long. All these people on Twitter <laughs> and other things are sending each other messages saying, don't go out, it's really dangerous, don't go out. So, of course, what did I do? I thought, I want to see what's going on. So I went out. And um, I went down into the town, and literally everything was locked. Uh, it was all shutters down, all the bars, everything, shops. And normally, and Tesco was closed, and Tesco never closed, except for the one by the hotel. But that's <laughs> um, that's shot myself in the foot there. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah, Tesco was closed. Everyone was closed. Nobody around anywhere. All I saw was just police. And me, basically, that wasn't a good combination. Um, <laughs> walking around, and that was it. And there was just nobody there, but there was nothing happening, nothing at all, anywhere. And I thought, how much of this is people just so scared by watching repeats of the same car on fire? Well, and, so, and I'm not denying that things happened, because I know some people in Tottenham and other places had it pretty bad, but they kept saying, oh, Liverpool's in flames and all this stuff. <laughs> and it just wasn't. It was like about 10 cars burnt out. And, you know, you could, over That's the course of a year, how many cars <laughs> get burnt out with? 
in Liverpool. In my one road. not really raised our average very much. <laughs> um, so it doesn't I, I really make a twi- difference. It, I mean, for Twitter, all that Twitter gives the option to communicate very quickly and effectively. It also gives rumour and you yeah. know, incorrect yes, information. It's really easy to spread rumours as well. Retweeting. And it's yeah. a massive yeah. amplifier for, for yeah. real life. Mm. The, at work in, um, in Uxbridge, uh, I was sat at my desk and there were rumours going around the office that Uxbridge was going to get hit. And so everyone should go home early. And lots of people took that as an opportunity to just go home <laughs> and don't really care about Uxbridge, which is fair. Um, but I looked on Twitter and looked for, you know, a hash Uxbridge. Bridge and Uxbridge, and there were loads of tweets and many more retweets from people who were clearly utterly clueless and completely disjointed from what the, the issues of the day were, but just going, oh my god, look, and then retweeting. And that yeah. massively amplifies what the real signal is, which is, you know, there is a problem somewhere, and everyone seems to amplify everywhere else in the whole country. But it's also our only chance if the media tells all of you if the media tells Dan Liverpool's on fire and he then goes out and it's not on fire, he being on Twitter and telling everybody, hey, I'm just here down Main Street and there's nothing happening. It's only police here. It's the only chance for everybody else to know. But it's, what but it's, it's, a, it's, it's a it, self- was. it wasn't just the media. The issue was that a lot of this was coming from Twitter where people were posting yeah. things that weren't true just it's, because they it's wanted to be sensationalist yeah, well, and say, oh, there's a car on fire outside my house and stuff like that. And, and people actually got caught out because they were proved that it wasn't true. Surprise, you know? Twitter's full of idiots. Well, it wasn't just... <laughs> the internet all right. is full of I idiots. Said, <laughs> I said Twitter, but I mean the whole kind of social media, so Identica and everything else was just as Let's bad. shut it down. <laughs> They're all dumb. Let's shut the whole thing we've down. we've this point around, so what we need to do... <laughs> right, let's take a, a yeah, let's question. Some microphone. Microphone. Um, yeah, Dan, I know what you mean. When you live in Liverpool, you have to develop a certain uh, threshold of tolerance with these things about <laughs> only the 10 <laughs> cars. So, um, <laughs> um, it, it strikes me that people are forgetting how freedom works. When you give freedom to people, freedom goes both ways. People have the freedom to, to use it for good things, but to a certain extent, there is the freedom to also do bad things. You can't just quickly take it away when, when something bad happens and only give it uh, you know, democracy and all the other good things only people when people do decide to use them for, for the right thing. So I think if you want freedom, you have to be prepared for a certain risk of things going bad and dealing with them the democratic, the proper way. There are institutions to prosecute these peoples. You can't just take away freedoms. Now, we, we don't like it anymore. We'd li- rather like be like a dictatorship uh, and we'll shut down everything because uh, we, we don't like it. And people who are not prepared to take this risk don't really deserve the freedom. You either want freedom or absolute guaranteed personal safety. I lived in a communism regime and mm. the street crime was quite low but believe me the price to, to pay is quite high so you either are prepared to pay the right to, to have the freedom or mm. not and the second thing is that it seems to me that nobody quite knows for sure or has figured out why these riots have really happened there are lots of opinions but nobody seems to have figured out mm. what the core reason is so everybody is, is rushing quickly to, to patch things by turning off Twitter and, and doing mm. this and doing that mm. without anybody having an answer to what, why this thing has come about. Mm. Yeah, I think we quite deliberately want to, to, to steer away from uh, getting into a discussion about why they occurred because they're clearly that we will be here all day and it's not really within our remit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you're, you're right. There are, people are taking guesses to what the causes might have been and therefore um, trying to guess what um, they might do to turn them off. Just, just very quickly, I mean, I, I come from Germany, which is a very different country. Um, I don't know, I think you don't have a constitution no. per se, right? Let's not get um, into that. In, in, no, the, the thing I wanted to discuss is there's no absolute freedom. In Germany, we have a constitution, you have freedom of speech. We have lots of rights, constitutional mm. rights, but all of them, or most of them, are subject to certain limitations. So you, that's the... You can't shout fire in a cinema, you know, because you endanger people. And the thing I see that I find dangerous is that these politicians could actually quite well say that, you know people using Twitter in this instance is hurting society and is hurting our democracy and they actually had a reason. They would have, they could argument um, that they shut it down that way. I'm, I'm not saying that's good, but you know, there, there's no absolute freedom even in a democracy. Okay, and yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to say that, you know, as much as people want to like get rid of stuff like Twitter and everything, um, people need to remember that bad news spreads quicker than, you know, good news. Everyone knows that yeah. it's a, it, transcends cultures and everything and as much as you know people can say well 
you know, uh, the wrong information can spread like wildfire through Twitter, it spreads exactly the same through, you know, the normal media channels. It's just, mm. you know, it's amplified just as so much like Dan says. You know, it's the day-to-day. -day. It's, you know, if anyone's a fan it's of Chris war, Morris, yeah. they, everyone knows. <laughs> That's it. It's war. war. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's... Yeah. it's <laughs> That's what happens. It's you know, it's, it's jungle human there. nature to want to know about the bad things rather than the good. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Can we have the mic down yeah, here? Axe had his hand, hand up for about an hour. Time, so. I think you had his hand up. Do you need from to the go to the toilet? Talk. <laughs> it's all right. They're restocked now. You'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> to come back to the point that uh, Fab made there. Yes, uh, having freedom means that people have the freedom to do bad things, but society recognises that there are some things where you want to put some limitations on it. perfect example is you can't just go and buy knives if you're 14. Um, if you're in America and you want to buy a gun, then you, then you need to wait for a waiting period. That sort of thing. So is it reasonable? Do you think it would be reasonable to treat Twitter a powerful tool in that way? Maybe people should have to pass a test. Well, <laughs> before they can use... Do you know what... As much as, as much, yes. Yeah, I think absolutely. it's more that if people are abusing it, then you need to take it away from them as soon as you can, rather than saying, you know, rather than, I suppose, blacklisting rather than whitelisting. Well, no, it depends on, okay, it depends on, it depends on your definition of misuse, but if you're inciting a riot on Twitter then maybe you should be banned from Twitter. I think the, the police should yeah. actually just do their job and arrest <laughs> the people who announce under their real name on Twitter that they are on the riot. They just, just, just go there and arrest them. It's not that hard. I'm sure they are. We, I, I know there are other people who have had their hands up, and I'm sorry, uh, but uh, we have to move on a little bit into our next segment now. So uh, we, we, we're sure we can continue this discussion in the bar tonight <laughs> over a few... <laughs> Very I mean, reasoned and meaningful videos. debate, I'm sure it will be. Yeah. I'll even sing you a song about it. I, like, yeah. <laughs> I, I want to find out more about Axe Plan. Too, this town is coming like a ghost town. Have a test, use a computer. <laughs> yeah. Right, so um, a video was posted on YouTube um, a few days ago uh, from Anonymous, the sort of hacker online prankster group who came out of um, the 4chan message, message boards um, threatening to essentially take down Facebook. That worked <laughs> well, didn't it? Alan's just done it. I think he just took down Hopi. <laughs> it's an SSD, I don't care. It's dead, Jim. He just mentioned anonymous and they sent a, an yeah. electric charge to the laptop. <laughs> they do not forgive. Um, so yeah, so they've basically said that because Facebook is bad for people because it's you know a, a sort of anti-privacy and they're taking your data and that's all they're really there for anything else is just a ruse so they can get more of your data that it's then they've then taken it upon themselves to say right if you're going to carry on using it we're going to take it down whatever that means we'll find out on november the 5th because that's when they threatened to do it right oh, okay. but that's is it right for well, who, who are these self-appointed people who've decided that they should know, they should say what's good for us and what's not? But then again, are they raising a very good point and are they doing it in a way that might actually get through to people in a way that other campaigns don't? There have been a lot of more uh, higher profile DDoS attacks. And those who've been, of us who have been on the internet for a long time have heard stories of people using botnets to take various sites off, off the web. And it's always been a challenge that, that groups of, of uh, illegitimate computer users have tried to do. Mm. But there's been a lot of very high profile takedowns recently. And it, uh, the internet has always been a system whereby anybody can do what they like within the protocols that, est that establish it. But... Uh, this is, it seems to me like we're reaching a point that it's almost completely unpoliceable and there's not much we can do when we have these anonymous groups of people who just, um, you know, decide, oh, I'm going to take But by definition, down. it's a group of people. It's not just one person, okay, orchestrated made by, maybe by a small group of people, but it's clearly a large number of people who have a common interest. And in the real world, they might go on a march somewhere or they might protest or they might have a petition or something. It's still a group of people who have a common interest who may well have uh, an opinion that is right. For so one it's of a form word. of protest, DDoSing yeah, absolutely. Facebook or whatever. Except they should get permission for the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Dear Mark Zuckerberg, can <laughs> I shut down your site? <laughs> are, are we sure that they're just going to DDoS them? I mean, well, I, okay. Right. That's an assumption on my behalf, but, you know. Um, I, I, I'm just thinking about, I mean, Facebook has traditionally not been known to be very secure. 
uh, like the company security. So maybe, I mean, they could Might take down the database, for, for example, like, I don't know. Well, and publish everyone's data that Facebook yeah. already publishes. <laughs> Embarrassing photos of people getting drunk. Or oh, delete wait. everything. Drop table users semicolon. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Bobby tables. Wait. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. At what wait. point, though, is it, is it becoming more like um, vigilante justice or something, you know? Because, I mean, I, I like to think of myself as a libertarian and all that, but I don't like the fact that anyone has that kind of power to take mm. these things down. And it's great when you can watch them take down people you don't like. But what happens when <laughs> they turn on you? You know, no one should have yeah. that power, that, I don't think. That is, you know, I, I worry when I've got my own little VPS that's got nothing particularly interesting on it. And it's, you know, I think I've got it secure. I put my software updates on there regularly and I, you know, I keep up with, um, you know, the latest PHP bits and bobs here and there. But then I still think, but there could be some zero day thing that I've never recognized. Now, I'm not, you know, an important target. No one's going to go after me like they go after Facebook. But... <laughs> You know, if they wanted to just go around and look for you know databases that have got data in, they'll probably find a way into my VPS and get my stuff. I want to take this opportunity just to mention that Linux Outlaws likes Anonymous, and uh, <laughs> I think they're cool. So uh, <laughs> that's not what you said to me earlier. <laughs> Covering one. That's not what back. I said either. But <laughs> dude, I'm running the server. Come on, yeah, okay. don't do this to me. <laughs> Who pays the bills? That's you got to fight fire with fire sometimes. Um, yeah, I don't know. It just seems like a worrying thing to me that, they, that they've got all this ability to take stuff down. I mean, if we, I know this kind like of links, back, links back to the previous point in a way that we talked about, but I mean, people are going around shutting down supermarkets and stuff and denying ordinary people the right to get stuff and, and, and thinking they're doing us a favor by doing that because the supermarket's evil and to a certain degree I have a, a sympathy for that view. But when, at, what, at what point are they just doing criminal things? Well, they're obviously doing criminal things. Yeah. I mean, but it's, all, it's different taking down the website and burning down the building. I okay. Think. Well, well if, your, if your company asset yeah. is your website, exactly. they, are amount, they do amount to the same yeah, it's thing. It's like building down your sh burning down your shop. Well, no, what, what I meant is like, um, if you compare this to these riots where a lot of like, just people uh, were hit, and here the target is definitely a company. Yeah, mm. but there's still people who work there. There's still people who go there every day and pay their mortgage based on the salary they get from that company. There's still people affected either way. Mm. Well, let's hear what Ron's got to say. Um, the thing that occurs to me about that announcement is they've announced a specific date. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how much of this is um, hype to yeah, show, a a show of bravado. Is Can it I really going to happen or is it an attempt to make people aware of the insecurity and the data gathering that's behind Facebook? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's I a think good, it's a good one, of the, one of the reasons they pre-announce and give a date is so that all the little script kiddies who don't really have much of a clue in how to you know hack into a website can download some fancy tool and hit a button and point it at facebook which is what a significant chunk of the people actually do they're not people who have intricate knowledge of the patch levels of mysql databases on these servers who have found zero day flaws they're people who download a tool smack a button and throw loads of traffic at a server that's effectively all they're doing Okay, let's go up there. Hi. Um, I was just interested, uh, it's a connecting point. I was just wondering, seeing as they've you know, specified a date, I was wondering whether you think that they may be trying to create similar to a run on the bank. So mm. persuade people to go, oh, actually it is insecure, and then just all run away and in that way bring down Facebook by getting rid of all their users because maybe the users really leave. They're really working for diaspora. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's DDoS by leaving. Google Plus. <laughs> Didn't they just pick the date because it's, isn't it Guy Fox Day? Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it is, It's yeah. the whole V for Vendetta thing. It's V for Vendetta. But by, yeah. the, by picking the date, then people know, oh, I, need, I should leave before then. Well, stock up on it, beans it, before then. If you believe in the idea that this is about you know, um, pr promoting uh, a fear of unreliability in these services, then telling people you're going to do it makes a lot more mm. sense because it gives them three or four weeks or, in this case, I guess a few months longer to sweat over it and worry about what's going to happen mm. to their data. Well, this is the the real thing, the real sort of contention within me over this is that you know, I've seen thing, people do like things like this before. For instance, um, the Firesheet plugin for Firefox, which allowed anyone on any open Wi-Fi network to log into someone else's Facebook account and various other websites. And suddenly, all of these services are sitting up and saying, oh, we need to switch to secure connections. And, you know, even like at work, I thought, oh, this will probably affect my users. I need to look into this now. Otherwise, people are going to start getting their data stolen. 
Yeah. yeah. But this is different to like pen testing or something, though, isn't it? Because if you're a white hat hacker or something, you're going to pen test a system. That's fine. You pen test it. You do whatever. You don't get 5,000 of your mates to also hammer it as well and destroy it and take it off the internet and then go, oh, that wasn't very secure. <laughs> you, you don't smash it to bits. You just like go open the door. Oh, that's not very secure. And then you go and tell them and say, your door's not very secure. That for me is what White Hat is about. It's, it's not... Well, maybe the this, fact that this Facebook, isn't the same. Facebook has a bazillion servers in data centers all around the world. You have to get 5,000 no, people maybe. to I kick the doors down. One guy with a key isn't enough. And, and it's also, interestingly enough, in front of the law, it's the same thing. If you're going to hack somebody's website to, you know, to, to tell them, oh, you need to use SSL, and you're actually doing it as a white hat hacker, it is, in most jurisdictions, just as illegal as if you were just mal- maliciously like, DDoSing their site. Mm. Where did the microphone end up? Okay. So I was just wondering if this is really a technical question as to whether they really want to prove Facebook's security being broken or are they trying to make a point about who owns their data? It goes back to the talk this morning. What do we put in Facebook and do we really want it all there? Mm. Similar for Google or any other company. Mm. Facebook's just the you know, person of the moment. Where is all our data being kept? That's right. And if Facebook is offline for a day, okay, probably most people will be all right. But there are a lot of people Speak who... Speak for yourself. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Farmville. What will we do without Farmville? I'll tell you what, gardens of time, my brother. Oh, there will probably there be will. rioting. There will be a riot, yes. Um, <laughs> and we're back to the beginning. Yeah. yeah. But we'll come full circle. No, that's a different show. Right. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, okay, yeah, probably everything would, would be all right if it was off, offline for a day. But, you know, long term, people have uploaded a lot of very important, significant pictures and data in there. There are backup services, things like Backupify, so people can get them out. But, of course, most people aren't using them. They trust the cloud. Cloud. You but know, even are if you we get right to trust the cloud? If Ack nods, yes. Put all you your data <laughs> in a one, two, one. Even if you get your data out, you have no guarantee that they have deleted it. True. With, Go- exactly, with Google, yeah. if you, if you, when you hit archive on a mail, it says it moves it to a folder and you, know, you don't see it anymore. If you click on it and then hit the bin, it deletes it. But does it really? Probably chances are not. It will be reaped at some point in the very distant mm. future. But chances are all that data is still there. So even if you close your account, you're still hosed because your data is still on a backup or on one of the ma- very many mirrored servers that they have around the world. Unless you can convince them that use DBAN on this server. <laughs> so Which isn't it, very likely. <laughs> if that is the point that Anonymous or whoever it is that's trying to hack them are making, are they, you know, are they doing it the only way they feel they can? Maybe they're just trying to run DBAN on their servers. <laughs> Well, yeah, because, I mean, there have been, like, people saying, don't put your stuff in Facebook. Mm. It's bad for you. These are the reasons. And no one's listened. Even I'm still on Facebook, even though, you know, I was waiting for Diaspora. I thought, that's brilliant, and it came out, and I have not used it. Mm. But if this... And neither does anyone else. That's the problem. Mm. If this sort of thing is going to happen, then, you know, not just people like me who care about this, but normal users who up until now haven't cared about it might start caring about it because they have to. But even if you did care that much to shut down your Facebook account and put all your data that was in Facebook in Diaspora, you haven't actually achieved anything. You've just taken your data away from Mark Zuckerberg and given it to five guys in Boston. I could put it on my own Diaspora. Or your own Diaspora. Which is what I'd do if I did Which the anonymous could hack and take as well. Cool. At least they they don't get you. (laughs) What have we got to say on the mic? Going back to... Are anonymous a good force of nature or a bad force of nature? They're not the problem. They're a symptom. It's we, the IT industry, don't value security enough. Uh, We pay too little money to fixing the problems that anonymous are able to exploit too easily. So don't go after anonymous. Fix our systems and get more money because that's what it will take, put into security. Well, if they're just DDoSing them, it's not a security question. It's just a question of bandwidth, which you can't solve. Like, if somebody wants to DDoS you and they get enough people using Loic and pointing it at your IP, you're dead. There's nothing you can do against that. Just solve it with more bandwidth, don't you? Okay, next question. Um, I was just wondering, um, you know, by not condoning or speaking out against um, Anonymous, are we, in a way, condoning vigilantism? So we're upset that people go around rioting and then we would be upset if that person um, then went round and committed a vigilante act. So is there any difference? One is in cyberspace and in real life you would be under the full force of the law. It's just that the law hasn't caught up to deal with the information age at the moment. Yep. 
Um, so there are other n- ways of doing it. By not speaking out against Anonymous or any other group that perpetrates these acts, they feel they have a legitimacy to mm. go ahead and do mm. it. And that's, I find, difficult to, uh, you know, difficult to accept. Whilst I don't particularly like Facebook, and it could well be that people like the CIA own it or whatever and say, what's the purpose behind it? You still have to, if you want freedom, you still have to allow people the freedom to use Facebook, even though it's insecure. It's their choice, their risk. Mm. And if you lose all your data and nasty things happen to you, well, you've just got to let people do that. Yeah. So it seems to me they're trying to be like the internet equivalent of Charles Bronson. Um, I don't really know if that, I like that idea. I mean, I don't mind the films, but I wouldn't want to see them in we real life. We should just <laughs> shut the whole internet down. I think it's the only solution. We're back at the same point. Why is this? Yeah. <laughs> You're back at the same point. But the thing is, right, I see a lot of people who, um, I, I don't want to generalize either because it's not just young people or people of any age, but I do see for some reason a lot of young kids who really think Anonymous are cool and what they're doing is cool and stuff. But it's because maybe they don't like the people at Anonymous Attack. And I know I made this point before, but what happens, if we, I mean, I don't really care whether they close down Facebook or not, but that's just me. But what if they decide they don't like Ubuntu 1 and they decide to try and destroy Ubuntu 1? Axe's not going to be very happy and all the people at Canonical, and a lot of people here won't be very happy. And that's my issue. What happens when they start taking aim at, at someone else? that we do like we haven't really been targeted in the the free software community no. as far as i'm aware specifically <laughs> how would you know yet until tonight say, yeah until this i goes think online. identica has been um okay. if i understand correctly has been targeted by yeah DDoS you've attacks. been ddosing that for a long time <laughs> 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 stress testing it's stress testing he's moved to google plus now <laughs> that was good where did the mic end up just a quick uh, reply to the last uh, point that's been raised. I'm not condoning or justifying or supporting either Anonymous or the people who write in the streets, but to my mind, there's a big difference between somebody like Anonymous who at least are pretending or claiming to have some sort of principle or reasoning behind their action mm. and somebody who goes out in the street, smashes up half of the town, and when they're asked why they're doing it, they are, well, um, uh, well, um, it, could be something to do with rich people or to, with government. We'll think about it later. So I, I would say the, the two things to me look quite different in that respect. Cool. Okay, well, thank you on that contribution. Anybody else got anything to say There's on this? There's some segment? more hands up down there. Yeah, okay. We've got to wrap it up before too long. Um, mm-hmm. so I think the overall point, the reason seems to be that free trainers are cool as far as the riots go. That's yeah. all I've seen. A lot of people, Gen- oh, free trainers. And, and shell suits. Yeah. Free flat screen TVs. I think one of the points with Anonymous and especially LulzSec, whether you condone them, whether you like them, whether you think they're cool or vandals, the fact is that they are able to do what they're doing. Mm. And they are groups drawing attention to what they're doing. The question you then have to ask is, who's doing the same thing and not drawing attention to it? Mm. Um, And I think whether you agree with the validity of how they're making that point, it is a valid point that there is a lack of control at the moment. The the point that was made that we need to get our own shops in order um, is definitely a valid one. And um, I think there was a, a threat report came out recently that said, you know, anonymous and lulls should be somewhere way down on your list of concerns. We've had things like the RSA breach this year. Mm. Uh, sustained five-year compromises of 70-odd organizations. These are the things we should concern ourselves with, with security, not, uh, not a bunch of kids with some JavaScript hacks and some DDoS tools, uh, even though they get the headlines. Mm. Yeah, well you're right. Well said. We have had some very big data breaches this year, and a lot of data has, has been gone. We're going to have to wrap this segment up and move on to the next one. But thank you very much indeed for all your contributions. So um, I thought, uh, as the third segment, we would um, go go along the, the the people that are sitting here and and talk about software that since we last met at our camp, mm. we've we've started using free and open source software that we we start using and really love now, and uh, just tell you why. Um, after all this doom and gloom with the world coming to an end, that's probably uh, mm. nice to to you know have a nicer point. Now. Is it? 
I, it depends on what software you choose, I, I guess. So um, I think maybe Dan, you, you start yeah, and then okay. we go. Uh, yeah, okay, so um, my choice would be something that probably a few people here have used. Uh, Drupal 7 came out in the last year, and um, I'm, I love Drupal, I'm a big Drupal guy. I know it has its problems, but um, the reason I like Drupal 7 so much is because they've actually finally addressed a lot of the huge problems we had with like the admin interface, which on Drupal 6 and earlier was completely useless, basically. I was trying, to, I was trying not to say something too offensive there. I don't know why, you've got me in that radio form mode. <laughs> um, yeah, so fill in your own expletive there. But yeah, it was really bad. And they seem to have fixed a lot of problems with Drupal 7. And um, I really, I've seen massive differences in it. Now, for years, we got to a stage where Drupal seemed to just sit. At this, I mean, it does loads of cool stuff on the front end, and there's so many things you can do. You can write your own modules, which I've done in the past, and all of that. But the admin interface and all that, well, as soon as a user tried to log in and actually post content, they couldn't, and then they'd say, why doesn't it work like WordPress, where I just log in and go, new post, and then, and it's done. Mm. And it didn't. It was never as good as WordPress as far as, as, far as that kind of thing goes. And they, they're still kind of dealing with the upgrade thing as well, which on WordPress, fantastic. You press a button and it upgrades. That's got a lot better now as well. It's not the same as FTP and all the stuff, you know, all the time and all that, which I think in this day and age is a bit strange for, a, you know, for that kind of web app, for you expecting end users to run it and stuff. Um, so that's really cool, and they've actually done a lot of similar stuff like they've got the same admin bar now across the top so on every page you've got a bar with the tools on it because in the past you would go to the admin page and you could install modules that would give you these extra bars but they were never quite that good you know uh, like the admin menu and stuff and uh, they've actually fixed all that and you can really just and when you log in now it's just got two buttons one says add content and the other says I can't remember now there you go that's how simple it is log out and um, <laughs> too simple it's not simple enough for me I want one button that says add content um, yeah but you can still do all the complex stuff as well they've just kind of abstracted it a bit so if you want to go beyond that and still write your own modules and whatever else you might want to do you can do it but you know, it's easier to use for end users. So I don't know how long you want me to talk about that, but that was my, I think that's enough. That was my point, my pick <laughs> from this week is, uh, is Drupal 7, which is, of course, open source and fantastic. And we used it for the website this year, for the Odd Camp website. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fab was like, I'm not having this wiki oh. business anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I will put Drupal on it. And it's yeah. worked really well. Yeah. Yeah. Really easy to use. The OS new interface needs a little bit more that stops yeah, me losing an entire a page that of was, text. That was my <laughs> configuration, to be honest. It's not <laughs> I think it's the problem was fab. before, like, they were like a good place is over here, and they were like here, and now they're there and not yeah. here, so they're just really This close is making good, good podcasting. This is good podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So everyone yeah. listening, there you go. Laura. Uh, okay, mine's not entirely open source. <gasps> oh. uh, it's a bit Freedom open hater. source. And I think that's a point of controversy, but I stay out of it because it's quite cool. Um, I uh, started doing research, that uh, academic research, last October, and so I have lots of PDFs to manage. And Mendeley.com, and Mendeley, is, it's got a uh, rich client that you can install on Linux, just works. Um, and that's pretty good. It just manages, it's just like a, a library sort of thing. It manages PDFs, and you can tag them, annotate them. It's a bit slow to respond to requests and bugs, but in the kind of open source way, you can submit them. Um, I think the open source bit is that it uses... Um, oh, JavaScript. Some, no, it uses... <laughs> <laughs> there is a, a web-based open source equivalent, and it uses code from that, but it doesn't make the whole thing open source, and that annoys a lot of people, apparently. Hmm. Interesting so. licensing, possibly, there. But. No, it depends on the license, but it's, you know, I like it. Okay, mine's, mine's completely open source, free software. It's <laughs> Blender. Yeah. This is my example for, um, for an app where we in the, in the open source community have something that is, in my opinion, better than a lot of commercial stuff. It's at least right there. And um, when you open it up, you don't think so. It's complicated. Um, it's damn hard to use. But what I always try to tell people is this is not because it's open source software or, or anything. This is because it's a good, you know, 3D modeling program. I used to be I used to be a Windows user and um I started I can't really do this stuff. I'm just playing around with it. But I started using Lightwave and if you, which is an industry standard program. If you watch sci, you, you can't have watched TV science fiction and haven't seen something that was made in Lightwave. Um I mean if you I'm a big Firefly fan, all the stuff they do in Firefly uh Battlestar Galactica the new one this is all Lightwave and Blender is up there and their interface is, is just as horrible. Like, it's not horrible, it's just... <laughs> oh, that's it's, all right, <laughs> It needs to be that way to, to do the stuff you have to do. And so Blender is really awesome. Um, it's supposedly now a really good video editor. 
I haven't got into that. I'm planning to do, but people tell me it's probably the best one we have. And Blender is really an application that if somebody asks you, is there, is there an open source free software program that is as good or better than the equivalent proprietary thing, I think it's Blender. And it's not like GIMP where you could really argue that the Photoshop interface is better. Especially the new, if you, if you tried the new 2.5 Blender interface, it's really good. And it's an awesome program. And if you want to do anything in that space, try it. It, it rocks. Cool. Cool. I'll start mine with a question. How many of you are using the Wi-Fi here right now? Put your hands up. Yeah, me as well. So that was installed last Friday. And before that, we didn't have you know, any Wi-Fi here. And we were kind of getting a little bit panicky. Well, I was getting really panicky about uh, whether we <laughs> so would have wireless panicked. for yeah. the event. So I went and bought that wireless router, which is over on the end of the table, and a 3G dongle, um, and that's got a USB port in it. And if you scan for wireless networks right now, you should see that device, and it should have a name, OGCAMP11, and feel free to all try and kill the 3G dongle that's hanging off that. Um, and I bought that and thought I was under the impression that something like DDWRT, which is software for routers, would be able to do what I want to do. And what I wanted to do was share my 3G dongle out as a wireless access point, even just as emergency backup internet access. Turns out DDWRT isn't as um, flexible as I was hoping it would be, and someone suggested something called OpenWRT. So I got OpenWRT, I flashed that thing with OpenWRT, it was really easy, and I followed some guy's blog post, which was edit three or four files, reboot the router, and it just works. And it is awesome for turning uh, an access point into, I've effectively turned it into a very, very expensive MiFi, which <laughs> you, you could buy, and they're this big, and they run on batteries, mine doesn't, and is much more expensive. And but it runs free cooler. software. Yeah. Uh, although I can twiddle around with the network on that, whereas a MiFi, you can only support like five devices. That could potentially support everyone in this room, although you'd all get one bit per second uh, <laughs> download rate from my 3G dongle. So, yeah, OpenWRT is my favorite. Um, I think I'm going to go with own cloud for mine, which we've talked a bit about on the show this series. We interviewed one of the guys. Basically, it's a system. Well, it's yeah, it's called own cloud. It does what it says on the tin. It basically lets you run your own cloud services from your own server using your own disk space, not having to pay for someone else. Or indeed, you could pay for someone else. You could buy a VPS and put it on there. Um, it's a PHP web application. You literally just install it like you install Drupal or you know WordPress or something like that. Stick it in, install it into a database, and all of a sudden you've got cloud storage ready to go. Um, and the project's um, looking at like making um, a, a platform for making cloud apps. So wherever you are, fire up your web browser, log into your own server, and use you know online office stuff and things like that. Um, and I mean, the reason I like it so much is there's been a lot of talk today about, um, you know, it's brilliant to be able to use the cloud and have that convenience, but how much of your data are you willing to sacrifice for that convenience? But with um, a project like OwnCloud, there's actually a solution for this in the works where you can have the best of both worlds. All you need is, you know, a computer that's on all the time and you've got your own data, not only... Um, does no one else get to see it, but you get to control things like how much you have as well. Cool. Okay. I had about three minutes to think about what I've done in the last year. and uh, Should the, about cover it then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, funny, you should be the one to come up with that comment because my yeah, piece yeah. of software that I chose was a piece of software that I ended up putting together when we started to do our live shows because we wanted to do them live streaming out on, on the net. Um, and Alan said, okay, well, we'll do that. I'll, I'll write you a piece of software to play out little jingles and music and things. Um, and how's that coming along, Alan? Yeah, I think I've got a template or something, yeah. Yeah, there's a Word document, isn't there? Um, <laughs> so just as a quick hack, I put together a little shell script to play out all these tunes. And after months of uh, you know, intensive you know, GUI engineering, uh, it looks a little bit like, um, well, it looks like a shell script on a, on a black terminal that I realise I haven't it's got my... Blue. Yeah, but no one <laughs> else can see. Sorry, Blue I'll say that into the mic that no one else can dead. see. Oh. oh, here we go. It looks like... <laughs> there you go. It looks like that. That's what it is. That's just an amazing piece of software engineering. I think you'll all agree. I've missed my vocation. Um, 
I'm going to submit that for an award next year. Is that um, open source? You want to get onto yeah. the summary it's code? It's open source. Get onto Google. Like, get onto Google's that. summary code, yeah. It is open source. You can download it. Patches are welcome. Um, I'm amazing. Please give me a job. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Press four. No, I'm going to go with eight. And then, um, but what we're going to do is going to ask anybody if they've got anything they really have enjoyed playing with in the last year. If there's anything that's really changed their world, rocked their world in the open source world, put your hands up and uh, we'll have a microphone to you. There was one uh, halfway up and the back on the middle. Right, actually I'm going to cheat and add to the OpenWRT plug. Um, I've played with it a while ago and it, it is quite powerful. Remember, you can actually install on one of those routers using, using OpenWRT something like Asterisk and turn it into a tiny telephony server. Wow. People have plugged in uh, USB sound cards and turned them into internet radio clients. <laughs> um, you can actually install Samba and an external uh, f uh, hard drive and share all your files internally in, in the house or from the internet. Open VPN, almost anything that a server will do. Obviously, within the bounds of, of the processor, power wise, but otherwise, uh, they have been used as brilliant little microservers and all sorts of things. Yeah. Well, one thing I forgot to mention when I said you could connect to that wireless access point, I forgot to mention the key. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I tried. I, I didn't mention it. I didn't uh, it the, the, key, the key is Popey is awesome. Uh, <laughs> I'm not <laughs> typing that in. I only set that in case we set up emergency and they had to have that printed everywhere. Right, right. The key is a lie. <laughs> uh, my piece of software was something that um, was a great big surprise to me. Um, uh, my girlfriend and I have been watching TV shows on iPlayer on the Wii. Um, everything's DRM, so you can only listen to a show or, or watch a show, and then it's gone. I found a, a script. It's called Get iPlayer. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, and it's just absolutely fantastic. The BBC haven't shut it down after years and years of use, and you can I, still... I think they've, they've tried. tried. <laughs> I thought they, yeah, I thought they tried quite hard to shut it down. But it's a shell okay. script, so, you know. Yeah. Pearl. It's, is it Pearl script? It's Pearl. What's this oh, yeah. iPlay you speak of? Uh, it's something Online we have in, in Britain that's brilliant. You and can buy it in Germany. No, actually, I, I agree with you. I... I used, um, a few years ago, when we went on summer holiday, I used Get iPlayer to drag down basically all of CBeebies uh, onto, <laughs> onto SD cards. For yourself. Because I really like Rory the racing car. And um, we, Who doesn't? we took it on holiday, and the kids um, used to, when we were getting ready in the evening, and the kids were bouncing around in the, in the chalet, we just put a laptop on a sofa with that on, and they loved it. It's fantastic. Brilliant. Uh, okay, let's have another one. Uh, I'm tempted, of course, to say the Hacker Public Radio community who are the best community in the world, but <laughs> what I will actually say is um, Inkscape. It's come uh, yes. a lot. Yes, I have to second that. And all, can I suggest... All the stuff is done in Inkscape, by the way, all the shirts, everything. If anyone uh, is interested in Inkscape, go to screencasters.hedonext.org, yes. and it is really, you can't buy that sort of uh, training online. It's a brilliant, brilliant program. I totally yeah. second that. Yeah. Inkscape's awesome, and Hedonext is awesome as well. Cool. One more? <laughs> <laughs> right Is there anybody the right if, at the back? If we could get right another one the down the, the front, stairs. then another one at the back. Yeah. Ne next year, can you, when, when there's rioting around, can you steal me a shirt that actually fits next year? <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be really nice. Why are you looking at me when you said that? <laughs> Okay, um, keeping in mind this is my first dog camp. Hey, well done. Hey, welcome. welcome. Um, welcome. Thank you. Um, I, did, I, did go back, I did go to Log Radio Live in 08 and just haven't yeah, had time for anything since. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> so did Lone one voice. other person, apparently. Uh, yeah. but, aren't, we, aren't we glad we're not doing it in Wolverhampton right now? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but yeah, tool I've been using for the last couple of years and because I'm a distro hopping tart unit booting, it makes life so much oh, easier. Yes. Yeah. Get a stick, throw yeah. things on. Yeah. So Unibooting. brilliant. I can try out like 10 distros in a night. <laughs> Excellent. Wow. <laughs> that's a, Ten heck of a great Saturday life. night in. Yeah, yeah. Totally <laughs> Bring them along tonight and then we'll see the how many we can get through. Okay, we need to wrap it up, the, up, up there and uh, we'll move on to the last bit. That's a bit of number eight. <laughs> I told you I was a good software engineer. <laughs> Wait. There we go. <laughs> now, if your terminal was green, that would have been much cooler. I couldn't yeah. write anything as awesome as that, Tony. No, no. You've done very well. Um, so it's the final few minutes, and we just wanted to spend a couple of minutes. First of all, 
thank you all for coming. Uh, it's very good of you. We are still going to be here tomorrow. It's not a <laughs> go home. But um, Yeah, please yeah. come back. Yeah, <laughs> come back. If you entered the raffle, you can't win it until you, unless you come back tomorrow. That's our way of trying to get you to come back. Uh, it's, it's really good to see so many people who've travelled a long way mm. and, uh, and come we, here to chat and engage with other like-minded people. It's we really, really, cool. really, really, really do appreciate it. You know, there are a lot of people who've travelled a long way and mm. thank you so much for coming. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we need to th- oh, yeah, I well, thought we were going to clap you then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, there's a couple of lists of other oh, thank yous. Oh, I see, yes. Um, <laughs> Don't drop it. That's why this works. Read. Read. <laughs> read. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, so next, well, next people to thank are, of course, uh, the crew and the helpers. Yes. Uh, yes. And crew. Can you stand up, please, really crew? Have... Everybody's in a crew shirt. Stand up. Stand up. Crew. Have a wave. These guys were here at 8 o'clock this morning helping set stuff up, they carrying really boxes around. Amazing. Which is more than some of the people on this stage yeah. were. I walked in this morning <clears throat> thinking, right, I know a load of stuff that needs to be done. I've no idea how to do it. And all of a sudden there were a bunch of people around me who seemed to know exactly what was going on. And yeah. within two hours everything was working. Yes, it's really it was amazing. <laughs> literally the amazing. Magic crew pixies. Yes. Um, also, a couple of special thanks uh, to John Spriggs, who I mentioned earlier for writing Campfire Manager and helping me set it up, even though he couldn't be here today, and to uh, Laura Tchaikovsky, mm. whose name I can pronounce now, <laughs> um, for just generally everything she's done to help out the event. And also, there's a note here to remind the crew to get their free mugs. Yes, if you're a crew member, you get a free mug. Please make sure you collect one. Oh, I, I now get to see what the last thing is. Um, party reminder. Yes, party tonight at 7 o'clock. So you've got a couple of hours to go away, uh, find something to eat, maybe, you know, change a T-shirt or something. Um, just because it's quite warm in here. Um, uh, it's in the cellar bar, which is out of the foyer uh, on the right-hand side as you come in tonight from 7 o'clock. Please bl- bring your beer tokens along with you, both, you know, actual money and the blue ones in your badge. Um, uh, I need to actually pay them the money... So uh, give me a few minutes to sort that out. You know, don't go at five to seven and go, can I have my uh, beer, please? They will just look at your blue piece of card and laugh at you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, hope you can come along. There's going to be some live music and stuff going on, isn't there, Dan? Yeah, what's going on? Yeah, um, there's going to be live music. Wayne's going to be playing. Wayne Myers, who's up at the back there. He did a, a talk before. You want to come down here and play because he's really good. Um, I'm going to be playing and I'll make him look good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and who knows what's going to happen? It's going to be a, it's going to be fun. I've, I've got a huge hard drive full of music there. So if you've got any tune you want to hear, you can come and see if I'm willing to play it. There are some things I'm not going to play, but um, <laughs> but give me a try because we've got everything. So um, let me know, and if you want to, you know, submit a request, we'll try and fulfil it. I think I saw some Bewitched on there before. <laughs> oh, score! <Really? laughs> Was that just by the Black Lace? Yeah, <laughs> I could do. Yeah. It was quality music. But yes, that's about wraps it up. We will be back here tomorrow. The doors open at, um, yeah, the doors open, I think, at 10 o'clock tomorrow again. Um, so uh, we're going to be here just a little bit before that. There's no need to get in here too early. You can leave your car in the car park overnight, obviously, at your own risk. I think the charging stops at 6 o'clock. Um, so if you want to, you know, have a bit to drink and not drive it home, you're welcome to leave it in there. Free parking tomorrow. Anything, anybody got anything else to say? Let's get drunk. Facebook must listen to Og Camp. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. What's that about? Quickly. We what? don't really know, but Facebook announced yesterday that they're using MQTT to run their new messaging service. And MQTT is a, a messaging protocol that's been around for 10 years, 11 years now. Um, but last, no, the first Dog Camp, Roger Light, came along and heard Andy Stanford Clark give a presentation, mm. and the next day went and registered the project on Launchpad and produced Mosquito, which is an open source set, uh, version of the ser- implementation of the server. So we don't actually know, but I think we should claim credit yeah. for Og Camp getting is it as MQTT good as Tony's script? out there. <laughs> <laughs> it's much really better. Really, as good as Tony's it's much better. And Facebook so have taken it up. It's really cool that something that Ogcamp 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 did in, you know, two years ago has actually made its way into Facebook code and is now apparently going to be DDoSed by none of us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is a good point. I'm getting worried. We've come, the service. we've come full circle. It's definitely time to go and have a beer. Thank you very much indeed for coming, everybody. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.